Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which has been in lockdown since the coronavirus hit. We've been looking at the same sorts of issues in a virtual way that we were looking at in the real world before. We've got about 100 videos up on our website. Uh, they seem to get quite a lot of hits. We reach more people than we used to. One of the, as it were, softer issues perhaps that we really need to look at is the future of cities, the future of work, the future of how we all interact, in, particularly in the financial services sector, but more generally in, in economic terms. And the future of cities is the focus of this particular video. I'm delighted that we have three very distinguished speakers. We have Robert Mugger, who founded two think tanks, the uh, SOCDEV Group, the SOCDEV Foundation, which he set up in 2010, and the Igarape Institute, which he set up in 2011. Uh, the SOCDEV Foundation has concentrated primarily on cybersecurity and digi the digital economy. Uh, the Igarape Institute uh, looks at safety and justice in Latin America. They're both set up in Brazil, where he has done a lot of work on uh, cities, the future, of, uh, the future of work, the future of cities with Google, McKinsey's, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the UN, you name it. He's written seven books. He has a DPhil from Oxford, and he's sort of all world. However, he's Canadian, and he is currently sitting in Ottawa, uh, safe from the, uh, the vagaries of Bolsonaro. Yael Selfin is the chief economist at KPMG and a fellow at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. She was City AM's Analyst of the Year in 2016. She's, uh, uh, she's educated at UCL and LSE. She was formerly head of macro consulting at PwC and a partner at Volterra. Uh, she's written recently, not just, I think, in Scottish financial news, but more generally than that, on rethinking cities in an era of COVID. And Simon Jeffrey uh, from the Center for Cities is the policy officer there and the lead on devolution and transport. He's been there for seven years. And the Center for Cities has been doing work on what COVID means. But there have been a number of, of studies. I mean, looking very quickly through Google, I went back to the uh, Foresight Programme, the UK's Foresight Programme, which produced a long and wildly optimistic report on the future of cities in 2013. McKinsey's produced something a little bit more recently on tw in 2018. And ZEN, our friends at uh, ZEN have done a lot of work on smart cities with McKinsey's. Uh, the Centre for Cities has expressed scepticism about the sustainability of remote working, which I think is really important, uh, while accepting at the same time that there will be a shift to hybrid working, that there will be real job losses in the hospitality and retail sector, that there's uh, a, a need for new ways to get people around. I think that's really, really interesting. I hope that we can touch on it. Public transport it suddenly seems terribly unattractive, which accounts for why London is absolutely plagued with cars at the present time. And of course, they talk about the danger of virus phobia. Uh, I've, I could go on, but let me ask, first of all, uh, the running order is Robert gets to go first. I hope that he'll talk for no more than five, 10 minutes. Yael Selfing gets to go second, and then Simon gets to fill in the holes and back clean up. My colleague Jane and I will ask questions as and well when that is appropriate. I give you Robert Muga, all the way from Ottawa. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew uh, and Jane, for this very kind invitation. And, and great to be here with Simon and Yale to reflect a little on uh, the, this future of cities. Uh, and this topic is no doubt germane to your listeners, most of whom are presumably listening to this for the comfort uh, of their home in a city. Uh, but let me just start with the obvious, and I suspect this is a point that's been raised by every single uh, one of your commentators that, that is this, which is that as monumental as this crisis, this COVID-19 pandemic is, it's not going to kill cities. It doesn't spell the end of cities. Uh, and while it's true that you know some cities are down, many cities are down, uh, I think the key argument is that they're far from out. We've seen cities bounce back from pandemics and plagues uh, for as long as there have been cities. And this time will be no different. Uh, what COVID will do, and I, I suppose that's the focus of today's conversation, is reshape um, much of what we think about in terms of city, city living. It, it's going to reorder the, some of the spatial layouts uh, and some of the economies of our big cities, and it will likely expand the clout uh, of some of the middle-sized ones or more peripheral ones. Um, and as with so much else, uh, much depends on how long this pandemic lasts 
uh, how effective, <laughs> when and how effective a vaccination might be, and what are the other kinds of pro-health efforts that are going to be introduced to contain this COVID-19. Uh, because we're not going to be living, and we are certainly not in a post-COVID-19 moment. We're going to be living with this, I think has been said so many times before by so many others uh, for a long time. Um, the pandemic, like no other though, is a profoundly emerg urban emergency. Uh, and part of this is because we are a profoundly urban society. More than half of us live in cities, more than 75% of us are gonna live in cities uh, by 2050. This is unlike any other time in history in terms of the concentration of people in urban settings. And over 95% of the 28 million odd uh, reported infections and uh, close to 900,000 or over 900,000 deaths from COVID-19 have occurred in cities. Um, and it's precisely because our world today is so hyper interconnected and interdependent and so urbanized that our cities and our supply chains are being so dramatically affected by COVID. Um, but a key point here is that not all cities and city residents are experiencing COVID-19 equally. Uh, for the more than roughly 2 billion people right now who are experiencing some kind of lockdown or restriction, uh, especially those who are working on the front lines or who are living in informal urban settlements, slums or favelas in the case of Brazil, uh, who are particularly vulnerable because of pre-existing conditions, this is especially disruptive. Um, and we're seeing in, in some ways the way COVID is revealing these already pre-existing sharp social and economic and spatial cleavages and inequalities that strafe all of our societies. And there's a fear, I think a legitimate one, that COVID-19 will exacerbate and uh, extend and deepen and sharpen these cleavages uh, rather than redress them. So we've got a situation right now where roughly 80% of the world's global workforce has been affected by full or partial lockdown measures. Um, about 60% of the world's economy uh, workers are in the informal economy and don't have uh, sort of, I would say, clear safety nets. So we're talking about acute vulnerability that's going to persist for some time to come. And what makes this crisis so particularly worrying for cities is that we are entering, we are in a, a, a severe recession um, with the continued threat of a depression. Um, the IMF is predicting global GDP contra contraction of about 6%. Um, global food shortages, while they've, supply chains have held, uh, could tighten and fragment and fracture altogether, depending on how, again, how long this persists. And this is happening at a time when cities are already facing massive chronic revenue shortfalls and budget deficits well before the disease outbreak even hit. So there are not necessarily great reasons to be optimistic, um, even though I think the future cities is secure. Uh, there's not reason to be optimistic that it's necessarily going to be um, improving in the short term. And I just think it's worth reflecting a bit uh, uh, on the Spanish flu for a moment. We're not in <laughs> the early 20th century, but we've struggled through Act One of COVID-19. Um, Act One, maybe one and a half, and uh, we're now approaching Act Two. And there are concerns, although there's a sense that somehow we're emerging from this crisis or we're getting to terms with it, Act Two could be dramatically worse than Act One. And if you think of the Spanish flu, that it comes in sort of two big bumps, two bumps. The first little bump, between June and July of 1918 killed about 5 million people. The second and third bumps later in 18, 1918 and 19, early 1919 killed anywhere between 35 and 55 million people. This isn't 1918 or 1919, but I think we need to understand the message that this is um, a, a challenge that's gonna be with us for a while. But and here, let's get to the, the good news. It's not all doom and gloom. I think what we're seeing and what we're gonna probably hear about today is that there are, are many city mayors and urban planners and entrepreneurs who are not just developing plans to prevent the next wave of COVID-19, but are also thinking about ways of reimagining city living. Um, there are some who even see COVID-19 as a kind of uh, opportunity, even a, a potential for revolution in the redesign of more resilient and sustainable and people-centered cities. Um, you know, and I think some people even see this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, as a kind of warm-up uh, for what is the truly big disruptor which is climate change, uh, which we're already experiencing in dramatic fashion around the world, and which we all know is going to be uh, getting significantly worse. So let me just talk briefly as I close here about the three maybe trends that I think are gonna be significant um, when we think about cities. I mean, first, in the short term, we're gonna see big health moves in cities. We're gonna see mass testing and digital contact tracing. We're already seeing it. We're gonna be seeing the retrofitting of buildings and public spaces for social distancing. We're gonna be seeing uh, the bolstering of health systems and all of that. 
In the medium term, we're going to see much more digitization of retail, uh, this continued shift to remote and hybrid working and schooling and service delivery, uh, the virtualization of, of, of health and education, localization of food production, distributed renewable energy. I think there's a bunch of medium term trends, but I want to hone in on three that I think stand out. Um, the first is the move to digital. Uh, the second is the shift to potentially greener and let's say more pro-health cities. And the third is the rise of sustainable mass transport. So in terms of digitization, COVID-19 has forced, as we all know, full, full well here, Andrew, and you, you raised it in the beginning, <clears throat> it's forcing everyone to work and interact online. And I think it's compressed uh, the equivalent of about 10 years of digitization into just a few months. Um, countries and cities that had already gone a digital transformation or were in the process of, of transforming were in many ways much better equipped to deal with the shock of the pandemic than those who were more analog. Um, you know, because some cities were already deeply invested in e-services, expanding broadband, um, and this is going to continue. Uh, and the virtualization is going to generate some efficiencies and improvements, um, as well as some big challenges. Um, but at the same time, you know, in a world dominated by Zoom and algorithms that create, you know, we're living now in a world dominated by Zoom and algorithms that are shaping our consumption habits and reducing the possibility of the unexpected uh, and of our own creativity. Uh, so this mass digitization of services and the kind of growth of the digital economy that we're seeing also has a dark side. Um, and we're seeing that in the way that some, let's say, more authoritarian-minded governments are expanding surveillance and rolling out more invasive technologies ostensibly in the name of, of health. The second big trend I think we're going to be seeing flowing in cities uh, uh, as a result of COVID-19 is this move towards greener and healthier cities, as I said. Um, and there was some, I think, hope initially that COVID-19 was going to lead to a big shift in pollution. You know, we saw, and there are many reports of declines in CO2, uh, nitrogen dioxide as well, NO2 and, and, and PM2.5 particulate matter emissions. Um, people were hopeful that this might herald a great healing of the planet. Um, and it's true, emissions did fall quite significantly in the first couple of months with lockdowns as fewer cars and fewer factories were, were running. Uh, but they've roared back in the last couple of months. Um, so I think we have to be careful about overestimating the climate dividend, let's say, of, of COVID-19. But that having been said, you know, there are a lot of city leaders and residents who want to preserve this climate dividend uh, of the past year. And we're seeing more and more progressive cities and city leaders rethinking issues of density and overcrowding, uh, speeding up the deconcentration of some cities, uh, reinforcing the importance of decentralized neighborhood development and green development and pushing towards more affordable housing. So the idea of a complete community or the complete neighborhood is really catching on around the world. So are, and so are ideas of, of sort of donut economics, uh, the sharing economy and regenerative urbanization. So I, I think the key point here is that the most livable future cities are going to be more walkable and more cyclable. And we're going to see probably the rise of more emphasis on 15 minute cities. Um, and this won't only just reduce congestion, but it could improve public health, reduce pollution and, and even decrease crime. And let me just close finally with just some reflections on the final third big trend I think that we're gonna see from COVID-19 is the rise of more sustainable mass transit. Uh, COVID-19 is raising really big questions about the future of transit, including public transportation, but also what we're, what we're referring to in the business as, as micro mobility. Um, in the short term, Buses and metros are facing significantly reduced demand due to lockdowns, but also due to the fact that people are, are nervous about getting on them. Uh, ride sharing services like Lyft and Uber are going to struggle to retain their ridership unless they make much better emphasis on, on social distancing adjustments. Uh, but in the longer term, I think what we're going to be seeing more of is the flourishing of more sustainable mass transit and pedestrianization. Uh, and we've already started to see this in cities from Milan to Melbourne and everywhere in between. Uh, so-called pop-up bike-up lanes and open cities, uh, uh, you know, uh, facilitating more movement and, and of people both on bikes and scooters, but also by walking are going to become more, more permanent. We're seeing more and more cities just pulling up the pavement and converting roads to bikeways. So let me conclude. There, we have this window of opportunity to improve cities in a very bleak moment. Financing uh, this, these improvements is going to be, of course, the big, big question. But this opportunity won't necessarily last that long. Uh, leaders really need to seize the momentum uh, and make some big moves. And we're not going to see this happen everywhere, but we're seeing some early movers uh, taking action from London, Paris to Singapore, New York. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll end right there and hand over to you.
I, I think, um, my God, you're a Guardian reader. Um, I can see that this is, you know, the, the wonderful rose-tinted view of the future. Nobody over 50 should ever get on a bicycle. There aren't enough plastic hips in the world to compensate for the damage that will be done. Uh, I could go through all of the things that you've said and, and, and produce a, a less a counter. optimistic <laughs> alternative. But Yale, could you possibly bring it down from 35,000 feet to you know, 15,000 feet over London and tell us how we're going to do Yale Selfie? Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. So I'd start maybe by, by talking a little bit about the pandemic and, and just uh, follow, follow on uh, Robert on, on that side first and say that um, it is the way we see it. We, we see a, around, you know, a big, a big probability that the pandemic will end next year at some point, probably um, in the second, first half of the year, ideally, um, which means that the social distancing um, restrictions and, and the fear of using public transport itself, et cetera, will end in potentially less than a year. That's, that's our main scenario. Um, at, at this stage, we're quite hopeful with the development of the pandemic, of the uh, vaccine so far. Um, especially, and, and, and everything that I'm going to say today is really mainly centered about on, on Western, Western Europe and, and US, so, so developed economies. Yes, there's a big difference between the two, so this is just developed uh, economies lenses. So if we have that, then we should really start thinking quite quickly now on what will be post, post-COVID. What's the, what's the situation likely to be post-COVID? How much of what we've seen so far is going to remain permanently uh, change how much of it is just transition and people will gradually move back to where they used to be um, and, and how much of it will just re re be reversed overnight once as, as soon as people are allowed to are not worried about the the pandemic um, how, how they could just ch change uh, overnight and before I start talking about it in a little bit more detail the, the key thing one of the key things to think about is um, that a shock like a pandemic, like this one, or a very sharp recession, also it could be just any shock really in terms of a, a, sh a sharp economic shock, usually tends to have a long-lasting impact on, on people. So even though we will have potentially an end of a, of a pandemic um, next year, people will continue to be cautious continue to be a little bit more um, more mindful of, of, of keeping our safety net and, and, and just be, be more, their behavior is likely to remain um, quite different to what it was before. We're also likely to see uh, unemployment remaining relatively high for some time, and that is going to impact people's uh, perception. So, so that is something to bear in mind. The other thing to bear in mind as well is that even if we f we end this pandemic, that doesn't mean we couldn't have another one. And that also is very similar to, to household cautions. It's in terms of government caution and businesses caution. They now have a risk. It's a pandemic risk that they are going to put factor into their planning. So even though this pandemic might end, I think quite a lot of businesses will now factoring another pandemic or another situation where they cannot bring everyone together as one of the risks they need to plan for. And therefore, the future that we're going to see for cities and for, for businesses is probably going to incorporate this risk more permanently, or at least for, for the medium to a bit longer term, medium um, term. So putting all this as a background... Well, the way I see things going, and I could be totally wrong because, you know, this is very much um, a hypothesis because we will still need to see how things pan out. The way I see things going is, on the one hand, you've got businesses in city centers that were used to paying very high prices for, for rent or, or for property in, in city centers that now think, oh, hang on a minute, there's quite a lot of money I could save. And this is a good time to save money because I've got my, my balance sheet under stress because of this crisis and this big recession. So if I can cut 
my, my costs on real estate in city centers and operate just as well. Why don't I do that? Um, and it's not just, it's not just the, the real estate in terms of the building, but there's the caterings that they provide. There's quite a lot of things around it, services around it that they can save on. So from a business rationale, I can very easily see businesses increasingly planning on, on downsizing their present in city centers and encouraging to some degree, or, or at least not encouraging workers necessarily to, bring, to come back in mass to, to work um, as previously. And then from, from the commuters, from the workers' perspective, I think this is very much a mixed story. I think it's a very personal thing. There's people that are very keen to go back to the office um, as before. They, they just thrive in the environment of, of, of the office and that's what they want to do. There's others that would rather just work from home forever. And there's some, some that want to be in between. So we have a population that is a bit of a mix. When it comes to what it actually works, we have proved, especially in services sectors, but not all services sectors. So, you know, it's, it's a, my, my industry consulting a big chunk of it. We proved you can actually do a lot um, working remotely and, and working even from home. You could probably do more <laughs> because I can tell you, I, I see more people and I, I present and, and um, actually have access to more people across the world than I did in the past when I had to travel everywhere. So in many ways, especially when it comes to bringing in experts to different assignments, this is a much more productive and efficient way to doing things. And we at the firm have managed to actually bring on experts from all over the world to assignments that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise if they had to travel um, to any uh, to all these different assignments, so we can now have uh, give um, access to our clients, even if they're smaller clients for smaller assignments, uh, access to our best people much more than before. So I think there are plus sides um, in terms of business. It's not for every business, but there's a range of businesses where this actually makes sense to a large degree for 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 at least part part of the operation. So, so the way I see it, I think we will end up with a hybrid. We will end up with um, more people working from home for, for part of the time than previously, definitely, and working flexibly uh, more than previously. I think there's my, what, what's the change in mindset that is really important is the trust. You, I think most employers now trust their employees to work remotely and produce. And that's a big mindset. This, this presentism where you had to be in the office to prove you actually working until late at night is no longer the case. And that's a big change in mindset, not just in the UK, I think there's in, in, in um, other countries, um, for example, in Europe, that used to be very typical and I think it is less so now. So we are going to have city centers that will have real estate offerings that will need to will still be there. We're still going to have the offices. We're going to have a lot of services that's used to service commuters that now we're going to have potentially less commuters coming in. Um, and we're going to have space, office space that, that will be freed up. I don't think this is going to um, just become vacant. I think there'll be a new use to it. I think but what we'll probably see is an adjustment in pricing um in 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 city centers um and that could potentially bring in new type of tenants and and generally what we're probably likely to see is rather than people going to work and sitting in a desk is having city centers that are much more collaborative center so you people come there to collaborate rather than just produce so you could have a, a range of um, workshop spaces, collaboration spaces. You could have new tenants like universities moving in and collaborating more closely with um, local businesses in incubator type centers. And, and, and that would keep the center actually more dynamic than previously because we'll have many more interaction in city centers than now. And in terms of productivity, that could actually increase productivity um, than previously, 
And then I'm not particularly worried about the businesses around it that used to um, rely on commuters because I think there will be a different activity there. And there will, the only thing is that they will need to adapt to a new demand as a result of it. I think we still need the catering. We still need the auxiliary services there, but for a different type of activity. So what we would potentially like to see, it's very exciting but it is crucial that we get the assistance from local government and central government to facilitate that transformation in order to get a new city centre that is post-COVID city centre that really cater for, for that new type of doing business. And I'll probably uh, stop here. Right. Uh, I'm fascinated by many of the things that you've said. But one thing that really fascinates me is I've watched the Financial Times, the de internal debate within the Financial Times over the last five or six months. And initially, the, uh, the columnists were very much in favor of working from home. It's efficient. You can use Zoom. You can see more people all over the world, so on and so forth. And then slowly it's creeping in that there are all sorts of soft issues. How do you get challenged? How do you uh, have that kind of dynamic of an office? How, if you're younger, do you actually get promoted? You can do a task if you're at home, but how can you advance your career? And I'm curious there, uh, with a, an outfit like KPMG, where you have many, many people who are very ambitious, who socialize, you have a lot of people, young people. How are you going to handle that um, social dynamic? I, I can see Jane wants to come in on this as well. So, Jane. Yeah, I think uh, um, just to amplify that, the... Um there's a couple of things. One is um, you could have ins and outs more easily, that the people who come into the office and do the collaboration are the ins and are more likely to get promoted, promoted and so on. So the outs can work perfectly happily from home. Maybe it suits their work-life balance better, but they will be somehow second-class citizens in terms of the organisation. And another thing is, of course, the, um, the serendipity of the, you know, the water cooler moments and the spontaneous interactions with people in an office. So, yeah. so I, I don't think that will disappear. I just think that if I take myself as an example, I, if I go to the office now two or three times a week, rather than sitting at a desk somewhere and uh, for five days a week and, if, and just typing away mm -hmm. part of the time, when I do go to the office for two, three days a week, it will be meetings. So I go to meetings and I go to collaboration and I will still have the cool of, the water cooler moment and I will still speak to people and I will still go to dinners and, and, and lunches with, with clients. But the time when I have, if you like, the thinking time where I need to produce and I need to write my report, I would just do from home. I wouldn't necessarily do that in the office where I, well, at least in principle, have a little bit more peace and quiet to think. My thinking time will probably be at home rather than in the office. Okay, well, let's bring in uh, let's bring in Simon because Simon represents youth, and he uh, is presumably enormously ambitious. He presumably has a very active social life. He goes out drinking every night um, with his three hundred and fifty mates. How does he envisage cities evolving, given the pandemic? Are you as enthusiastic about working from home as uh, as Robert and Yale seem to be? Oh, I think there's there's loads of great things about people being able to use their own judgment about what tasks are, be are best served by face-to-face -face collaboration and what tasks are best served by, you know, maybe not having to get on the train at 7.30 every morning, packed in and pay £15. I think, you know, businesses already know that. I would, I would say there's just to, there's really not a lot I could add to what Robert and Yael were saying, but just situate the conversation a little about, this is very much, as, as you say, a Western issue. I don't really see these debates going on in Hong Kong or Seoul or, or all of these places. And actually, it's very much a UK and United States. I mean, in terms of people going back to the office, you're talking about 80% or so in, in Berlin and in Paris, but it's you know down at 30% in, in uh, UK. So there are definitely social factors, maybe there's pandemic uh, factors, and maybe there's actually kind of materialist factors about it being really expensive and really crowded and uh, really long to get into work in these places as it is opposed. So I think we, like those, those are underlying issues. They're actually not really COVID related, but you know, there's almost a sort of Wizard of Oz moment where it's been pulled away and people can see that actually 90%, 70%, whatever the number is of, of their tasks, their daily work, actually can be done plugging away in concentration, doing it. Now, obviously in London and some of these cities where you have people crowded into to houses because the house, because the city hasn't adapted 
to the growth that they've had over the last few decades, actually working at home is a bit unpleasant. Isn't that nice? So actually people don't really want to work from home, but they would like to work without the commute. So the idea of co-working spaces being brought forward, but people will still want to, exactly as has been said, go in two or three days a week, but really maximize the benefit of those commutes whilst minimizing the cost at other times rather than sort of trudging. And those things were already happening. KPMG, I'm sure, was already reducing the number of desks they had in city centers, increasing the amount of people who were working from home and figuring out which tasks they needed to be in and out on. But uh, as Robert said, you know, we've accelerated this 10 years. It's just like, you know, if on in, in if you if you know London and the transport network, the Southern Rail Line was having these terrible difficulties, it was almost, you know, a nightmare to get in and out of the city. Loads of those people would have already been thinking about work from home, changing their job habits. But this is just a massive shock to the system and everyone's getting it at once. But it not just being a kind of Western and UK, US thing, I think it's also a big city thing. Now, we cover 63 cities and large towns. And it's, it's very much those specific city centre activities where you can get access to the widest range of knowledge, the biggest pool of skilled workers in the same place, in the same room, having that collaboration being close to potential partners and clients and picking up bits of information, having that be as close to the market as possible. That's a distinct task. And we wouldn't worry really about the local services, you know, the pret a manger and the restaurants. You know, this, these will exist wherever people are spending their time, as long as those productive activities are taking place. That might only mean they're in the office three days a week. But, you know, fundamentally, they're still doing that task, creating that productivity, and they will have that money to spend on local services. And maybe they'll even have some more money to spend in their local vicinity if they're not spending it on commuting. Now, those distinct big city tasks, I think, if you look at some of our places, not even you don't even have to go that far down in the size of city, but actually in terms of uh, some work that we've done, looking at the footfall and the spend and the weekend and the daytime uh, analysis of different cities, you go to, uh, you know, let's think of you know, places like Wakefield or Bradford, you know, big places, their town centres don't really act as that kind of centre of knowledge creation and as uh, people have to such a demand to get in at nine o'clock on a Monday that you have to have these mass transport situations which do make commuting slow and expensive and unpleasant. They haven't really had an impact. You know, their city centres very, very much do act as the high street and we've seen that kind of recover almost completely in terms of people going out and spending. So it's very much, in an ironic way, the jobs that people were putting the most effort into getting to work, spending the most money on transport, spending the most on housing to be close to that transport, were actually always the jobs that could be done from home. But it is because they're knowledge jobs, which can be done you know, across a distance because knowledge can be you know, digitized and sent for free. But the rewards on knowledge go up dramatically when you create the networks, when you get that bit of collaboration with people and you create new knowledge, which is still best done face-to-face. -face. The widest bandwidth is face-to-face -face and exactly this sort of serendipity in the office, but just picking up what's going on. You know, when I know when I'm sitting next to my colleagues and they're saying something that isn't really directed uh, towards me, but it's interesting and I want to find out about it, that really does feed into what I want to do or I pick up on things that wouldn't be something that I'd go out and ask to be told about or I'd get involved in a conversation or just have a quick chat with someone who I wouldn't actually pop over an email and say, how are you doing? But you would exactly do that if you'd just gone off to get coffee at the same time or you just bumped into each other on the stairs. You would just have that little interaction, which isn't quite serious enough to actually go out of your way and kind of make, make an approach. Now, I think one thing that has been clear is that this technology was there. It's kind of a general purpose technology, the automation, essentially, of your commute. So it's been there, and different sectors have kind of been ahead of the game, places that are sort of towards the frontier, especially you know, digital uh, and programming have been much better at it. But this shock has really brought it on and people have been able to uh, realise that you, you can do these things. Uh, and I think there's been a massive benefit to that to people. I would say a couple of things that the underlying trends about why I think people in the UK, especially I'll, I'll stick to the UK, want, uh, there seems to be such a big debate about leaving cities. I think it's because we failed to really you know, we talk about being able to transform to this change. We haven't transformed to the changes of the, the previous 30 years where we've had this renaissance, but we haven't built enough homes. So how, housing is small and expensive. And like we're talking about potential people leaving cities to work from home. Well, people have already been leaving cities and that's lower income people <coughs> haven't been able to afford it. So this just might be now that we're going to have to adapt to uh, richer people who choose to leave. 
partly because we haven't really responded to poorer people who've had to leave because of their economic circumstances and haven't had the choice. So if we're going to transform, that will have to be a, a new thing because we haven't really transformed in response to previous pressures and, and growth on cities. Um, and if you do that, then maybe people aren't going to want to leave cities as much. If you did have to not share a room with or share a house with four people into your 30s, or you could uh, buy a house or, you know, there was um, clean, uh, safe ways to cycle around your city and not be around traffic as much. Maybe then people wouldn't have this kind of dream of uh, moving out to the suburbs or quieter places. But you know, there's there's been massive gains to the what are, is termed the gentrification of cities, which is good. We want mixed communities. We want you know people being able to access you know rich and poor accessing the same public services. I think that's a good thing. And there's real dangers I think to potentially if people did leave, then you'd probably go back to what you might have had before, which is areas of higher concentrations of poorer people generally seem to have poorer public services. And, you know, whatever the dynamic is behind that, then that is, is a concern. And, you know, the final point I'd make is in terms of the, the benefits of cities, the infrastructure that you have obviously is expensive, you know, and transport, and that's an issue if people aren't going to be coming in and out of the city centre every day, and there'll be that transitional impact on, on, on PrEPs. But a major piece of infrastructure that our cities have is UK is massively underserved in is housing. You know, even in some of our least developed cities, you go to Burnley, it's only 2% of the housing is vacant. Even with the number of people who work there having gone down in numbers of jobs for the, in the last century. So just the pure logistics of a, an exodus of people from cities, I mean, we're going to have to build a lot of housing. And I, I'm not sure that anything has particularly changed in Oxfordshire um, that's going to make people there want to build more housing. And if we look at the trends of where people were leaving cities before, it was the biggest destinations out of London were Brighton, Bristol, and Edinburgh. So I don't, I don't think it's people who want to leave cities per se. They still want these things, but you know, if it's really expensive and it's you know not as comfortable as life, then they're making decisions. And if, if we could just create a system where people can have productive jobs and get the housing they want and have the sort of commutes that they want. Then I think that's better. And if that's in cities and they thrive, then great. But if they can get that same productivity and opportunity in other places, then that's great too. But let's be realistic about the limitations on that. Um, yeah. I would talk about the climate, but I think that's another big element. Um, that's that a, a very big if that you've just thrown into the debate. I don't know. Yael, did you want to come in on that? I saw you. Um, no, uh, let me. Well, let me ask Robert. I mean, you've you've listened to two people from a, a primarily UK or, or, or European perspective. Uh, what do you? I mean, if you were if if you were speculating on the future of London, how would you speculate on it now? What would you What would you say? I mean, a lot of the points raised, obviously, I, I they're impossible to disagree with. Um, you know, I, I if I were to look at London uh, and and think about you know what's going to happen next, I, a couple of things. I think Yale's point about the repricing of the downtown core and about sort of rethinking of the opportunity space for, um, you know, commercial and or residential housing in downtown cores. I think it's going to create a new opportunity for more affordable housing, which speaks a bit to Simon's point and, and mixed housing and um, a kind of leveling of, if you will, of some aspects of the playing field, because we knew that London's prices were already astronomical and this may create uh, some, a, a bit of rebalancing. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a potentially an opportunity to, to address some of those questions. Um, Number two, I agree fundamentally with the point that cities are these places of innovation, of creativity, of um, where ideas spark, where where you know opportunities are, are are achieved. And I think young people will continue to move towards cities uh, as that as that opportunity space. There just are no other the digital realm doesn't offer the same kinds of uh, alternatives. So we will continue to see people, irrespective of whether the, you know the COVID disappears uh, next year or not. And I'm not entirely as optimistic, maybe as, as Yale is, but um, so I think we'll continue to see people moving and gravitating towards cities. And this won't disrupt, I think, the bigger mega trends around uh, movement towards cities. Uh, third point I'd say is that um, there still remains the challenge here about how do we manage in a city like London, uh, the, op the, the differential opportunity structures. Um, you know, I think knowledge workers, <laughs> uh, high value workers, university educated, uh, well-trained workers in the information economy in particular, uh, but also in financial, you know, and, and obviously in financial services and the rest, They've done okay out of all this. And it's true that a good number may not want to return. And it's also true that companies may want to maintain that. But for the vast majority of others working on the front line or working in retail or working in 
um, you know, hard industries, uh, et cetera, their lives have been profoundly disrupted. And I think the, the idea of living, working from home, um, especially while managing all of the other services and childcare and the, and the rest is extremely challenging. Um, so I think we're f- in a city, big cities like London, I think unless we address that um, through a combination of protections and, and the rest, which are, obviously can't go on forever, uh, are going to generate some, some real tensions. Um, so I, 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 I'm very nervous about what's to come in terms of, I mean, I, again, if, you, if, if your scenario is that their vaccination will come into play and can be distributed effectively uh, and equitably and, and rapidly and you know, generates the kinds of outcomes that we hope, um, and, and ends, you know, as it were next year, then, then I think, you know, situation could be redressed relatively straight in a, in a more straightforward way, but the longer this goes on, the more challenging, obviously the scenarios become. Well, let me ask you yeah, on this one. I mean, there is a sense that the people who will survive best through this pandemic are those, the information workers, the, uh, the skilled workers, the people the people who already have 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 a good life, their, their life may actually get better. The people who have a pretty crappy life, their life may well get worse. They are the retail, the people who work in 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 retail, in in hospitality, uh, less well skilled. Is this just going to exacerbate cleavages within society? Uh, yeah, what's your view on that? On that? So, I mean, it is true that the the people that are most vulnerable to the pandemic are the ones in hospitality and and travel, and a lot of them are in the lowest scale of of earnings. Um, And what we would need to see is a a significant intervention by government to try and help them find new jobs, but it's also an opportunity for them to reskill. If we get the right assistance, it's an opportunity for them to reskill and move to other jobs that are potentially more productive and, and, and better jobs uh, for them. For example, we haven't talked about climate change, but there's a lot about the green energy. There's a lot of new jobs there, potentially, that they can um, they can um, transfer to. There's, there's jobs on, in the social care that, that should be better rewarded and, and where they can transition to. And the good thing is that a lot of these people, what they do have that, if you like, other generations where we had a structure of change didn't, um, is very strong social skills in the type of work that they have. So in that, in that sense, at least, it's easier for them to transition to other service type jobs potentially than in previous um, episodes where you had, for example, the mining and the manufacturing decline, where it was much harder to transition these workers to other industries. So I think we will need intervention by government to help. But I think if we do get the help and if they get, um, if, if they get that opportunity to move to a different sector, that would actually potentially be a good thing for them in a better future. There's just also one more point I wanted to mention on, on earlier when we talked about the future of, of cities and we're talking about, if you like, the secondary cities and, and why big cities like London will remain important. I think one of the cool things that um, cities will continue to provide everybody, even those that work from home, is what we call culture. And, and some basic assets on training. So, for example, the universities and the, the further education and, and trainings that everyone will need. Some of it will be done online, but a lot of it will still need to be done physically. And then we're talking about, you know, the, the theaters and, and the, the museum and all of that. That is really important to create an environment that people we want to, to live in. And that's important. We have a lot of that. It's very rich in London, which is why London will probably remain a very important city. People will always want to come and visit and and spend some time with that cultural assets. But it's also important that we have secondary cities like Watford and and the likes, where there's more offering beyond just retail, um, because a lot of retail will go online. So we need to have recreation uh, offering and a different type of mix of offerings that will still bring in people to the cities, to the secondary cities as well as the, the large cities, beyond just the commuting and the, the daily work routine. Uh, J- Jane, do you want to come in on that? I mean, the idea of secondary cities, um, of course, our, our two most prestigious universities are both in secondary cities. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that Yale raised the cultural hub um, point, which I thought it was strange we hadn't got to that um, earlier in the conversation. And of course, that will be related to tourism. So if her optimism about the pandemic being over is right, um, one could see a bounce back in tourism related to some of these the sort of cultural um, honeypot um, attractions. Um, what we haven't really touched on properly, I don't think, um, although we've gone round it, is um, if you can have a lot of vacant property in city centres um, as office, um, because of the fall in demand for offices and because of shops and so on, uh, some of the chains going bust, um, how easy is it going to be to convert that into the affordable housing that's been talked about? And the other thing is, um, I, we, I haven't heard um, what's going to actually happen to these expensive transport networks that weren't making any money even when they were crowded. So where, where does that leave us? Simon, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, well, it depends where. You know, we've got plenty of high streets with empty shops that have been empty since the last recession. If you think about uh, our northern towns, they're still coming off the back of that. You know, and there's bits of our tax system and, uh, you know, these sort of uh, balance, sheet, balance, sheet, uh, balance sheet recession that has just basically been terrible for those places that, you know, that there's just demand uh, at all. But I, I'd go back to um, what Yale and Robert were saying. Actually, this is going to be dynamic. In terms of, I, it's not like a company going bust and it going vacant. I think I think I would I would think landlords are going to want to ensure that these places do not fall empty, that they are could do as much as possible because, as you say, the cost of conversion or the cost of getting a new person to come in is going to be uh, incredibly difficult. And you're seeing that across, I think, uh, city centres, whether it's you know the Grosvenor Estate. These these people are doing it. They want to keep those those, those businesses uh, in place, but. No. You mean zombie businesses rather than convert them to something no, no, no. that might actually help with the housing problem you've described? No, I think the the, the housing problem is potentially going to be helped a bit by converting. I don't think that's the solution. I think allowing significant amounts of new development across existing uh, suburban areas is is going to be the, the challenge. You know, maybe a little bit in town centres, but broadly, UK cities are really not very dense, and it's about densifying those residential areas. I think would be the solution. Um, and because who knows, I, I think may, maybe with a vaccine, things do recover almost imperceptibly. You know, we might just look back and go, well, that was a bit odd, wasn't it? You, or the changes aren't as big yeah. as they were. Maybe that's the thing. So if the government wants, it needs to be open to transformation, but it needs to be clear that we're not just going to turn Canary Wharf into housing or, or as much as it already is kind of right. turning into housing in large parts. But, you know, turn all of the, the commercial stuff into housing because we've had eight months of, you know, not knowing what's going on. So, okay, so, I've, I've heard, so, um, but, so Robert talked about sustainable mass transport, um, but didn't actually tell us what that would look like. So well, maybe that we could just... Lots of cycling, he said. What's that? Lots of cycling, lots of uh, Actually, you'd be, you'd be amazed, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. I mean, I think just on, on the first point... Um, Sorry, I don't I'll, count I'll... walking and cycling as mass transit. I count right. as, like Andrew, as stuff I hope I must. I didn't well, know. When we talk about sustainable, um, we're talking about kind of, let's call it non-carbon uh, intensive forms of um, mobility. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a combination of different solutions. So if you go to a place like Seoul or Tokyo or uh, even Paris or Copenhagen, what you'll find is you've got your bus option, your monorail um, and your uh, metro short, but you've also got your scooters, your electric bikes, your bikes, uh, your pedestrian walkways, you've got your boatways, you've got your ferries. So it's it's the idea of creating an integrated and multiple set of solutions, not relying only on one and rezoning and rethinking uh, your spatial layout of your city uh, to be more pedestrianized and, and let's call it less oriented around the movements of, of carbon you know, vehicles. And the point is, yeah, it, it sounds a bit utopic, but at the same time, cities around the world are doing this. Uh, you know, the most livable city in the world is Melbourne right now. Uh, the mayor of Melbourne and their city planners have basically pulled up literally dozens of hundreds of kilometers of uh, how many, however, however many miles that is, miles and miles of pavement um, to repurpose the downtown uh, and, and, and the, the, the corridors of the city and the way people move. That will be more difficult in northern climates, obviously, or in extremely hot climates. But I think even if you go to Dubai, they're rethinking uh, some aspects of, of the ways in which mobility is going to be organized in the city in, in less carbon uh, intensive ways. Just on the point about... Um, housing uh, and and land and, and property in the downtown. I think New York is interesting. There's an article in the New York Times that came out just the other day, which described how um, landlords, property owners are essentially rethinking uh, the nature of their leasing and rental agreements 
uh, and just as companies are also, of course, recalculating their horizons, as you already mentioned, in terms of their, their, the likelihood of their stay in these cities. Uh, and so they're very quickly adapting to this environment in terms of shortening rents, in terms of re thinking about rezoning and lobbying for rezoning, uh, in terms of thinking about mixed housing together with mixed uh, you know, uh, commercial properties, uh, and then thinking about multimodal or multipurpose use uh, housing. These are trends that are already in some ways happening in some parts of the world. Uh, they're just again, again being accelerated. Well, it'd be interesting to see if that happens in London. Property developers in London are pretty hard nosed and a lot of them are carrying an awful lot of debt and they are not very keen. They have this mysterious thing called upward only rent reviews. Uh, I'd be fascinated to see if that disappears. Uh, final word, Yao, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you are relatively optimistic. Put yourself two years ahead. Assume that COVID is now behind us. What does London look like? And in particular, I guess, what does the financial services sector look like? What does the consulting sector look like? So, so I think London is in a particular sticky place at the moment um, that is, is different to other cities just because we have Brexit looming in the background and, and not only that Brexit could potentially have a, quite a significant impact on the UK economy, it will definitely have a big impact on the city. And the city is a big part of, of London. So I think more than COVID in some way, where I think COVID will, will come and go and there will be some long-term structural um, changes around it where we would potentially have less offices but much more collaboration and we'll potentially have a different mix of people uh, living in, in central London. So we could have... Um, coming back, the, the opera levels uh, um, retirees that will now have the Pierre de Terre and will be living in central London and visiting the theatre and the opera on a regular basis, whereas the, um, the family, uh, the guys with the younger family will move out a little bit more. So we could have this um, you know, shifting of, of population within, within uh, London a little bit. But I think we'll, we'll still have people living here because there's so many assets that people will enjoy. Um, and there may be just a bit of an adjustment in prices to reflect that, but we'll still have a lot of cooperation, a, a lot of collaboration, and it will still be a very productive environment. The main issue is what will happen to financial services, how much of that will go to Europe and how much of that will stay here in the UK. This is very much a political decision and, a, and, and really a choice for the European consumers as to how much more they want to pay for financial services in order to bypass the, more important, the most important financial centre next door to them just for the sake of having it um, in their own, on their own turf, yeah? And I don't have an answer to that. I think what most probably it will be a slightly weaker and different city, but how, how much, we don't know yet. But I think if we, even if we don't have finance, we will have other things gradually, so we will probably have more digital, we'll have more um, clean energy type consultancy and stuff like that. I, I am quite confident that, that London will continue reinventing itself because ultimately, bottom line, it's a great place to live in. It's fun. Expensive, but fun. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Expensive. Um, I don't know, um, you know, Simon, I keep representing that he suggesting that he represents youth. He represents the kids who are outside my window starting drinking at four o'clock in the afternoon and drinking till 10 o'clock. Where do you anticipate your career? Do you anticipate it being in a large city like London, Simon? Or would you be willing to go to Norwich or Nottingham or, you know, Sunderland uh, if, if, that's, if that's the future, the medium-sized city? I mean, I, I'm probably a bad person to ask. I was born and brought up in inner London, so I'm uh, massively not leaving. So, uh, But I, I think there's definitely places that I go to that, I think many other, other people, people would look at our oh, fantastic to. Manchester, Birmingham, you know, we go there regularly, we work, Brist you know, obviously Bristol, but the biggest cities that have really underperformed are getting much better. Norwich is lovely, but they need much stronger economies and they need to actually build a lot more houses. Like the differential in, in sort of affordability is still not good enough. Like no cities really do it properly. It's 
you know, you need to be doing, it needs to be more than Milton Keynes that's pulling its weight on building housing. You know, if Manchester or Birmingham want to pull out and be, you know, the European city, the second city, they need to really go for it and really build more housing and, and make it so that people in their 20s can go, great, I'll go and earn 24 grand a year, but I'll only pay, be paying like 500 pounds rent and I'll have loads of money to go and spend and do loads of stuff. And there'll be loads of other people like me as well. Okay, the final word is with you, Robert. Um, how do, does London survive? Obviously, London of survives. Of course, does it going to survive as a successful thousands city of or years? To survive as a you know a little bit a shrink shrunken image of its former glory. I think the destiny of London obviously resides in the hands of of Londoners at one level. I mean, we've got the geopolitical tensions, of course, uh, and and Brexit, of course, looms over all of this like a shroud. Um, we've, we've got, um, you know, the affordability questions, which Simon mentioned, which is keeping, I think a lot of people out and, and maybe not allowing London, London to punch even more above its weight. Um, and we of course have this looming question or lingering question about the future, uh, of, of COVID, um, and the reluctance, I think Yale's point about the fact this is going to have a long tail, um, both economically, but also in terms of attitudes and behaviors. And people are going to be a little bit reluctant to go out to cultural events. Um, and, and to in, in, indulge in all of London's assets uh, so long as they feel that this, this, this risk is still there. And I, I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, there have been a lot of viral outbreaks, even as we've had COVID-19. They just haven't become epidemic. So this is not the last uh, pandemic we're going to be seeing uh, in probably in our lifetimes. So I, I think that London um, has... I think it will survive. London is incredibly, extraordinarily innovative. Um, it, it constantly is able to reinvent itself. Uh, I think that it, it's, um, you know, tackling this question of affordable housing, I think, has to be central. I think uh, dealing with issues around digitalization, as I said, um, and around, um, you know, greening the city, which has already been ongoing for the last couple, at least the last two decades, uh, you know, I think I think will be will be key to create more livable spaces. and. You know, I think livability, affordability uh, are probably the buzzwords and watchwords, because in the end, I think most people will be drawn to London's assets. But, you know, you're going to be competing more and more with the secondary cities. Uh, so it will be important that London creates those opportunities for younger generations of people to continuously come in and replenish it. Because, look, at the end of the day, cities are always where the future happens first. Cities uh, tend to be also where people on general, on average, live longer, earn more and live generally happier lives. I mean, survey after survey reminds us of this, but it doesn't mean that you can rest in your laurels. And so I think London will have to constantly be looking at ways of attracting that next generation of people uh, to, to come in because they will want to come to this city that offers so much. Uh, live longer, earn more, and be generally happier. That's really, that ought to be the motto of the City of London. Can I thank you, Robert? Can I thank you, Simon? And can I thank you, Yale, and my colleague, Jane? and all of you for watching. Many thanks.